In the ancient world, craftsmen were Promethean figures empowered by a capacity for invention, for craft understood in the sense of cunning. As framers of things, their work borrowed the divine function of creation, recalling the role of the Greek demiurge responsible for fashioning the universe, or the blacksmith god, Hephaestus. These positive connotations of craftsmanship endure in the modern age, but are dampened by a combination of sentimental regret, neglect, and even disdain. In our own culture, the attitude of disdain reaches back through the class prejudice against manual labour to Aristotle's distinction between liberal, dis liberal pursuits and activities such as agriculture or manufacture that were seen by him as servile. Today's craftsmen and women contend with a popular perception that the handicraft element in craftsmanship entails a backward impulse, a failure to employ the latest methods. What this actually means alters according to whether we're thinking of modernity in terms of machines, computer software, or simply factory production. The larger point is that craftsmanship is at once cherished and embattled, a form of commitment that is always already out of fashion and thus always on the brink of revival. In the course of this lecture, I will make a case for the continuing rewards of craftsmanship, economically, socially, and humanly. Before doing so, I should discuss the contemporary fortunes of craftsmanship, including the state of making and manufacturing in this country. The most bracing recent challenge to the practice of craft has been cultural rather than industrial. Emerging in literary and architectural circles in the 1970s, postmodernism celebrated surface effects of style and ironized forms of historical reference. Its precepts were hostile to the principles that modernism inherited from the arts and crafts movement, namely a concern with deep structure and the unity of form and function. Not merely an art movement, postmodernism's socio-economic features have come to define what we mean by late capitalism. At the end of the 20th century, Theories of the postmodern were borrowed by British politicians who needed a language in which to justify deindustrialization. The benefits of the knowledge economy began to be promoted. Activities blithely termed metal bashing were to be abandoned in favour of high value services and product design. The thing itself needed to be manufactured but that process could be outsourced, usually to suppliers in low-wage countries where the pollution legislation was less rigorous and employment rights minimal. The consequences of globalised trade have been felt across Europe, but it was in Great Britain that the principle of offshoring production was pursued with ideological fervour. These developments in the commercial sphere have not occurred in isolation. Their effects are also apparent in our educational institutions. The Crafts Council reports that in six years, 2007 to 2013, student participation in craft-related GCSEs fell 25%, while in higher education, the number of craft courses fell 46%. In secondary schools, the dissolution of technical education, especially in metalwork, continues unabated. High quality tools, workbenches, gas forges and anvils are being sold as educational surplus. These decisions reflect a view of practical skills as old fashioned and a subject emphasis that sees design as an intellectual process separate from the content of making. Economic forces lie behind these developments, but so too do attitudes and choices. 
One of the earliest critiques of this modern orthodoxy appeared in a book by Peter Dormer called The Art of the Maker from 1994. Offering detail, detailed examples, Dormer cast doubt on the idea that conception and execution are separate activities and that execution, mere making, can take care of itself. The problem for him was not merely one of policy or economics, but a failure rooted in the history of Western philosophy. Dormer alludes to the Austrian philosopher Alan Janik, who identifies a reluctance among thinkers to take working life seriously. From this failure, Janik excludes Karl Marx, Ludwig Wittgenstein, and Leo Tolstoy. The name of John Ruskin could happily be added to this list of exceptions. Ruskin deserves mention as Tolstoy's teacher in matters of labour ethics but also as a continuing influence on modern ideas about craftsmanship. Indeed, his thoughts about the larger relation of craftsmanship to forms of happiness and human flourishing are more pertinent today, more influential even, than they have been for a century. So it's fitting that Ruskin should be the chief focus of this lecture on craftsmanship, one that I have the honour of delivering before the Guild of Agriculture and the Crafts that he founded. And I'm also speaking in anticipation of next year's exhibition at Museum Sheffield, entitled In the Making, Ruskin, Creativity and Craftsmanship, which is being supported by the Guild of St George. The financial crisis of 2008 finally discredited the idea that a healthy economy can be sustained by financial services debt fueled consumption and inflated property values. Talk of the knowledge economy has been replaced in government circles by allusions to a march of the makers, so far with limited effect on the trade deficit. Nevertheless, there are signs that a more vigorous and more independent cultural change is in progress. For the time being, craftsmanship is on everyone's lips. The effects are apparent in the vibrancy of long-established centres of craft education, such as West Dean College in Sussex, while hand-knitting, sewing and other crafts have not been so popular since the 1970s. Some of these developments are ephemeral or mixed up with a kind of austerity chic. But the educational, social and psychological benefits of making things are not so easily dismissed, nor indeed are its effects on the real economy. As people recover an interest in the provenance and quality of their, their purchases, a tentative revival is occurring in old centres of manufacturing, aided by the international reach of internet commerce. In Sheffield, a combination of media interest and renewed local support has brought notice to the city's little mesters, meaning independent masters. The first stirrings were seen in 2009 when a social enterprise saved the venerable workspace, Portland Works, from being turned into flats. In 2010, a maker of pocket knives na named Trevor Ablett became the subject of a Guardian photo portrait inaptly named Disappearing Axe, making a Sheffield pocket knife. Similar coverage followed in 2014, a film by Sean Bloodworth documented sharpening processes at Ernest Wright & Son, a Sheffield maker of scissors. Footage of the putter, a putter togetherer of scissors, went viral online, prompted a, prompting a rush of orders that suggest pent up yearning for objects that are well made and well sourced. If our art schools are still struggling to see an intellectual value in making, the tide is at least, or has been for some time at least, been turning among uh, practitioners, especially sculptors. The sculptor Andy Goldsworthy has been one of the pioneers in this respect. His work points the way in combining integrity of construction with a conceptual interest in the limits of the relationship between craft and functionality. I'm thinking in particular of his immaculately cut dry stone sculptures, uh, um, 
uh, among them reconstructed um, sheepfolds and pinfolds in Cumbria, and a closed so stone circle resembling a Neolithic burial site at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. It may not be possible to restore mass pottery production to Stoke-on-Trent, commercial shipbuilding to Sunderland and Glasgow, or the post-war era of Sheffield tool making, mass tool making, but one can at least address the alienation from our material circumstances that recent models of trade have fostered. Linked to this longing for an integration of what is thought with the experience of making is a revived concern with, concern with ethics, professional ethics in particular. At the height of the 1980s fashion for financial deregulation, Christopher Frayling, then at the Royal College of Art, took part in a public conversation with the craftsman and design theorist David Pye. Glossing a question from the audience about Ruskin's liking for rough finishes, Frayling remarked sceptically that the critique of modernism and the avant-garde is getting to the stage where some art critics are saying, bring the ethics back and bring them back through a revised version of what John Ruskin and William Morris were saying. At that point in the 1980s, Frayling may have thought of ethics as something faintly retrograde, a reversion to the high Victorian or moral theory of art. His reading of art history strikes me as less credible in the light of recent economic events and their immaterial causes. The failure of ethics in our banking system may seem remote from the aesthetics of art and craft, but there is a common link in the principle of good faith and accountability whose standards um, exceed the merely legal. Andrew Hill, a city editor of the Financial Times, observed in a series of articles at the height of the crisis that it was Ruskin, an art critic turned economist who rooted everyday accountability in professional values of commitment and probity. Ruskin insisted that these values should bind the merchant as well as the craftsman. He believed this because both groups made their living from dealing in confidence, a confidence whose abuse could re would rebound on the community before it rebounded personally or individually. In the second of uh, the lectures on Tuscan art, um, entitled Valdano um, from 1874, Ruskin quotes a passage from Thomas Carlyle that addresses the connection between industry and conscience in medieval England. This was a time, he relates, when Sheffield had taken to the manufacture of Sheffield Whittles, and there were seven incorporated trades with their million guild brethren. It was also the historical juncture, he tells us, at which the English people had acquired the faculty and habit of thinking. <laughs> Ruskin dwells in particular on this association between ideas of ingenuity with the hand, th on this association between ideas of ingenuity with the hand and ideas of conscience, thought, and fairness in exchange. In the third lecture entitled Shield and Apron, he characterises craftspeople and merchants as a third estate, having a pride of its own, hereditary, hereditary, hereditary still, but consisting in the inheritance of skill and knowledge rather than of blood. From this position of strength, Ruskin charts a decline, one that resembles the civilizational decline he detailed earlier in The Stones of Venice. Things come to a head at the close of the 16th century when pride emerges among the class of knights. Apparently cl clerical avarice is rife and there is a gradual abasement of character in the craftsman. The result Ruskin declares is common ruin. This portrait of an extinct practice, irredeemably lost and locked away, might suggest an ideal of limited re relevance to the pursuit of craftsmanship in the present. Fortunately, Ruskin habitually and deliberately disobeyed the strictures of his own analysis. This is most apparent in passages where the descriptive energy of his attention suggests a value 
that transcends the particular of a given historical moment. In Valle Crucis, studies in monastic history and architecture, Ruskin describes the German Gothic denizens of the distant European past. He writes poetically of the tempestuous northern belt, under the feet of whose fiercest soldiery had grown up, like the wood sorrel beneath its pines, the gradually softened and informed classes of the husbandman and craftsman. From the Goths, Ruskin move, moves to the Saxons and discovers a stirring affinity between their seafaring and the impulse to fabricate. Anticipating later portraits of shipwrights' work, notably in the poetry of David Jones and Ezra Pound, he remarks that there must have been good squaring and fitting in the timber of that coasting fleet. Lacking historical evidence, Ruskin's descriptions of sail making and cordage and all associated spinnings and weavings are instead stirred by colourful supposition. But there is also something about his contemplation of handy industriousness that spurs a self-generating extension of his prose in thinking of craftsmanship as an emblem of enduring human potential that waits in the, set, in the shade like the wood sorrel and quietly thrives. Ruskin thinks about craftsmanship as a flexible virtue, relevant to the present as well as the past. This is apparent in his proliferating list of Saxon aptitude. Craftsmanship is followed by seamanship, captainship, clerkship, the recurring ship playing on a derivation from the German suffix, suffix schaft. As Ruskin's manipulation of words reminds us, some of these concepts were still being formed in his time. The Oxford English Dictionary um, entry for craftsmanship gives no instance of its modern value-laden sense until the late 19th century. In his own usage, Ruskin recalls one of the earliest citations from that dictionary it comes from Thomas Carlyle's Chartism, published in 1840. Let a man honour his craftsmanship, his can-do, wrote Carlyle. In missing out the S from craftsmanship, Carlyle emphasises the word craft as opposed to crafts. His coinage appeals to an idea of native wit, initiative and strength from, uh, from, the, from the German, Kraft, aimed at shaming the idle aristocrat, as he saw it, into renewed social commitment. It also leaves some latitude for non-manual craftsmanship. In a letter to his father, a former stonemason, Carlyle referred somewhat defensively to his own orthocraft, Equally, he was taken by the idea of Nuremberg's singer guilds, among whom poetry was taught and practiced like any other handicraft. This elastic conception of craftsmanship has been employed more recently by the sociologist Richard Sennett in a book called The Craftsman from 2009. Sennett argues that craftsmanship names an enduring basic human impulse the desire to do a job well for its own sake, one that cuts a far wider swathe than skilled manual labour. In his view, craftsmanship serves the computer programmer, the doctor and the artist, and it can, can include parenting and citizenship. This is a seductive enlargement of purview, and it points to a venerable cultural history that I'm exploring elsewhere in my work. However, there is a danger that by making the leap from the domain of practical workmanship, we are led with a denuded virtue, one that insists on personal commitment, but excludes the manual context in which it has flourished, seeing them merely as a metaphor for a larger idea of professional excellence. Unlike Carlyle, Ruskin insisted on a manual discipline. and he made a conscious effort to become acquainted with the challenges of specific crafts and their materials. As is obvious in this passage from his memoir, Praeterita, which I'm about to read, 
he often uh, borrowed from the language of apprenticeship in describing his experiences. So this is Ruskin. I have to say that, my, that half my power of ascertaining facts of any kind connected with the arts is in my stern habit of doing the thing with my own hands till I know its difficulty. Thus, when I had to direct road mending at Oxford, I sat myself with an iron-masked stonebreaker on his heap to break stones beside the London Road just under Ifley Hill, till I knew how to advise my two impetuous pupils to effect their purposes in that matter. I learned from an Irish street crossing sweeper what he could teach me of sweeping. I worked with a carpenter until I could take an even shaving six feet long off a board. The instrument I finally decided to be the most difficult of management was the trowel. For accumulated months of my boy's life, I watched bricklaying and paving, but when I took the trowel into my own hand, abandoned at once all hope of attaining the least real skill with it, unless I gave up all thoughts of any future literary or political career. The kind of experiential learning that Ruskin proposes here and the reward in view corresponds closely to what the philosopher Michael Polanyi has called tacit knowledge. For once, Ruskin is not presenting the eye as the critical organ, but the hand. We are asked to accept that watching is no substitute for doing. Apart from emphasizing the, the, emphasizing the importance of experience, Ruskin dwells on the matter of precision in executing the basics. Indeed, he appears as much concerned with competence as with mastery, so that the craftsman is known not so much by conspicuous prowess as by an unconscious command of the rudiments. Ruskin reports personal successes, but note that, notes that one must choose between difficult things in life and not expect to be an adept both at bricklaying and statesmanship. Beyond this emphasis on personal experience, Ruskin expounded a number of principles that bear on craftsmanship as it is practiced today. In the nature of Gothic chapter of the Stones of Venice, he praised what he called the confession of imperfection. As a criterion of judgment, its effect was to countenance forms of roughness, unfinish, and even partial success, impressed on the workpiece in good faith, importantly, in good faith, um, through an honest encounter with human limits. Ruskin's next criterion is closely related to the first. Work that confesses its imperfection will lead itself to what he calls, will lend itself to what he calls changefulness, a kind of pleasing variation, um, which in combination with workmanly admiration for good and neat masonry, gladdens the heart of the observer and radiates wealth beyond the bounds of the contract between builder and patron, or builder and client. There is, importantly, a relativity to this conception in that unchanging change is, as Ruskin recognized, monotonous. This was what Ruskin calls, uh, called um, a diseased love of change. A third principle resides in Ruskin's insistence that the work of design should not be divorced from the act of making. This le leads him to argue that the architect should work in the mason's yard with his men, and to claim that the magnificence of the medieval cathedrals was owing to the freedom that each man had to work through his own fancies and flourishes. This controversial reading of medieval labor uh, medieval labor relations leads to the conclusion that manual labor is no degradation when it is governed by intellect. Put another way, Ruskin believed that work should involve the whole human being and that good art depended on the maintenance of this condition. Even when sympathetic to broader notions of craftsmanship, modern commentators have devoted a great deal of time to debunking these principles of Ruskin. To some extent, the urge to debunk reflects the sheer extent of Ruskin's influence and indeed an anxiety of influence uh, on the part of those who feel they must strike out in fresh directions. 
Early on in this process, in um, 1899, uh, Thorstein Veblen uh, attributed a propaganda for a return to handicraft and household industry to Ruskin and Morris, complaining that it was based on an exaltation of the defective that found in obsolete processes the honorific or cachet of a superior taste. Sometimes Ruskin is read through the technical shortcomings of the arts and crafts movement. David Pye, whom I mentioned earlier, was the grandson of one of Ruskin's disaffected disciples, the Victorian painter John Brett. In his excellent study, The Nature and Art of Workmanship, Pye wrote that far too much work propagated by the arts and crafts movement was either made by first-rate workmen trained outside the movement or else by inferior workmen trained inside it, who were prepared to invoke the spirit or the way in which they worked as an excuse for their ineptitude. Ruskin did pay too little attention to what was adept in the ordinary work of his time, and it's true that standards of workmanship in the latter stages of the arts and crafts movement were variable. Close attention to the joinery of the Hall of Blackwell a Bailey Scott house built in 1898 on the shores of Windermere reveals an appearance of pegged mortise and tenon that turns out to be surface deep. You can see from the image that there is, there is no um, um, tenon between those two um, surfaces. Um, it, it's, a, it's a sort of um, an illusion. Um, the Glaswegian architect Charles Rennie Mackintosh expressed his Ruskinian credentials on bor borrowing for his motto an aphorism of the arts and crafts architect J.D. Sedding. Uh, the aphorism uh, being, there is hope in honest error, none in the icy perfections of the mere stylist. Mackintosh's sincerity is undoubted, but not all em elements of his work were ennobled by an honest error. Examining the fire-damaged library of the Glasgow School of Art, the conservation architect David Page recently remarked that with Macintosh, you expect it to be amazing craftsmanship. We had always assumed, for example, that the great timber columns holding up the mezzanine, which really define the room, were carved from single pieces of oak. But the fire has shown, that, but the fire has shown them to be nailed together from a few lengths of pine, then covered with a facing plate. Architects, of course, must work with a client and to a budget, and Ruskin cannot be held responsible for measures that flout his, on, his insistence on honesty of form. More revealing are objections levelled at the theoretical underpinnings. Pi is again at, the for, again at the forefront of the complainants. Ruskin, he contends, did not realise that a fair proportion of patient, tedious work is necessary if one is to take pleasure in any kind of livelihood. This remark seems misplaced given Ruskin's insistence that the painter should grind his own colours. But the more sophisticated implication of Pye's analysis is that much craft work entails a proportion of relatively mindless work, and that if there is any pleasure at stake here, it derives from mere absorption in the task, not from creative or intellectual engagement. For instance, a silversmith must smooth the surface of a workpiece with abrasive paper for many, many hours, um, uh, often weeks. Um, this tedious process is part of the finishing process that precedes polishing, and it cannot be avoided. Relatedly, Pi castigates the most disastrous illusion, which was, a, uh, I'm, I'm quoting him here, the most disastrous illusion, which was encouraged by Ruskin's chapter and which has done the most harm, the illusion that every craftsman is a born designer. This seems to me a misunderstanding of an argument um, which, for all its appeal to creativity, insists nevertheless on a governing structure. But Pi is concerned less to downgrade the craftsman than to correct a supposed category error. He's proposing that workmanship of the highest standard does not perfectly integrate the hand and the mind in the way that Ruskin suggests. A less technical, more culturally critical challenge to Ruskin's legacy lies in the claim that he perpetuated an ineffectual, outmoded, and essentially nostalgic version of craftsmanship. Quoting work by Raymond Williams and Martin Wiener, the craft theorist, the craft theorist 
Glenn Adamson, emphasizes the primacy of a pastoral impulse in the arts and crafts movement that hid what he calls the hard truths of commerce. Frayling makes a similar case on reading George Sturt's fascinating memoir, The Wheelwright's Shop, from 1923. It's a work that describes the experiences of a schoolmaster whose fondness for Ruskin's Fors Clavigera was tested when he took over his father's business, a wheelwright's business. Frayling reports that day-to-day -day life in the wheelwright's shop was slowly convincing him that both Ruskin and Morris had idealised the concept of craftsmanship beyond all recognition. Richard Sennett offers a more positive vision of what craftsmanship might achieve in the modern world, and he acknowledges what is radical in Ruskin's vision, but nevertheless categorises him as the great romantic analyst of craft, who regretted the loss of the workshops of the pre-industrial past. I do not propose blind adherence to Ruskin's view of craftsmanship. He was a man of his time, and our times are different. But one of my concerns about these critiques is that they simplify a complex, historically embedded picture, and that they risk throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Seeing the pastoral as a sign of dogged or delusional attitudes allows one to ignore more contingent motivations, such as the relative cheapness of spacious workshop accommodation in rural areas. And it downplays the competing influence of ideologies that promoted an ideal of retreat for different reasons, such as the utopian socialism of C.R. Ashby's Guild of Handicraft or the neo-Catholic monasticism that later inspired Eric Gill's crafts communi craft communities. Moreover, Adamson's reading of ruralism passes over the fact that Ruskin and Morris provided historical accounts of craftsmanship that recognized the collective body of the guild as an essentially urban entity. It's true that Morris found a personal paradise at Kelmscott Manor, who wouldn't? But equally so that he kept his permanent home and his workshops in London. At the heart of the charge of nostalgia is the objection that Ruskin's suspicion of machines and of souls growing mechanical led his followers into a technological and a conceptual dead end. The distinction between a tool and a machine is philosophically shaky. And it's apparent that many crafts benefit from a selective use of machines, uh, such as a loom or a potter's wheel. Many machines are themselves the result of fine craftsmanship, whether one thinks of 18th century automata or the first screw, cu screw cutting lathe whose workings were hand chased by its inventor, Henry Maudsley. If these considerations reveal the folly of a prejudice against machines in favor of a craftsmanship that is supposedly separate and exempt, they also expose the shortcomings of our popular view of craftsmanship as backward looking. Ruskin was, it has to be admitted, capable of perversity and bloody-mindedness. To some extent, he actually enjoyed being misunderstood. Nevertheless, he starts is not what it's often taken to be. The burden of his concern lay in opposition to steam rather than to machines in the abstract, even if there are occasions when the latter seems true. Steam-powered machinery was forbidden on Guild land because Ruskin thought it a furious waste of fuel to do what every stream and breeze are ready to do costlessly. I hesitate to say that Ruskin was ahead of his time. His resistance to steam as artificial power is clearly superstitious, rooted in his personal mythology of a crusade against the fire-breathing dragon and a puritanical anxiety about idle hands. But it's obvious from the point of view of today's renewable technologies that he had some right on his side and that he was exercising his own kind of environmental prudence. Ruskin only restricted the use of machines where he saw a principled objection. For instance, he conceded the possibility that electricity might be useful in the future as clean energy. Ruskin's objections also reflect the fact that steam, the steam-powered machines of his day were relatively crude and rarely capable of matching the subtleties of finish achieved by handicraft. 
we now have the benefit of seeing what good design and precision engineering can achieve in de democratizing objects of use. But Ruskin could not be expected to envisage this, and he was in any case describing the conditions of his day. Seen in this light, the stipulation that machinery is only forbidden by the guild where it supersedes healthy bodily exercise seems more reasonable. There are hints of a job creation scheme here, but his words leave scope for using machines to perform unpleasant and unhealthy tasks and for preferring handiwork where the results are better. Even today, there are many processes that are best performed by hand, at least if our concern is with quality rather than quantity. There is no comparison, for instance, between letters cut in stone by a machine and letters that have been drawn and then cut by hand. In the latter, the chisel's variable removal of material expresses an individual rhythm and character, as well as the irreversible action of a moment. Precisely because the trained eye has something to offer in this area, the letter cutter, Lida Cardoso Kindersley, instructs apprentices at her Cambridge workshop to interpret rather than trace their original drawing on the stone. This process allows for the thoughtful reinterpretation, for, for thoughtful re reinterpretation at each stage, and it ensures the primacy of the cut, her dictum being that each tap of the hammer must be an incisive moment. Ruskin's controversial views on machines were not developed in isolation. In fact, they related directly to moral and aesthetic positions that have fared better with his critics. The emphasis on imperfection and changefulness repays particular attention because it lies at the heart of those qualities of finish that elude much pre-programmed work. As it happens, Pye is the commentator who offers the most convincing practical account of this phenomenon. In free workmanship, he suggests, the flat surface is not quite flat, but when seen from close by, shows a faint pattern of tool marks. And the straight edge is not quite straight, but seen close shows slight divagations, an effect that can also be achieved by the figure of mater natural materials and by wear, wear, weathering and age. Pai relates these effects to the Japanese cult of Sabi, the love of imperfection as a measure of perfection. Though this attention to roughness and to weathering seems equally indebted to Ruskin. Pi differs from Ruskin, however, in claiming that this quality, which he calls diversity, can also result from automated production. The point is well made. At one end of the spectrum, he observes the play of light on the imperfections of a mass-produced glass jar. And at the other, the character of his own wooden bowls, created using a tool partly guided by a jig, capable of cutting intersecting, intersecting flutes that are uneven in width and depth. And we saw one of his bowls on, on the front cover of the book I showed you earlier. In my own choice of images, I want to move us towards a clearer sense of what remains pertinent in Ruskin's humanly focused concept of imperfection. Pi attributes diversity, as he calls it, to approximations. My sense is that these effects would be better described as the result of what is inadvertent in a skilled human process, the uncontrolled consequence of a larger intention. This slide shows two very different kinds of brick wall. The left-hand image shows a Cambridgeshire cottage the upper stretch of whose rear wall contains original bricks laid roughly in a herringbone pattern. The colours alternate subtly and the finish is pleasingly uneven. These effects are attractive, but they were not all planned and they are not the result of great skill. Rather, they are the circumstantial result of firing batches of handmade bricks on site or close by according to the rural, rural custom. The right-hand image shows an interior wall of the British Library. In the area above the marble frieze, the monotony of industrial brick has caused the architect to include two regular breaks in the brickwork in an effort to add definition. 
The beauty of the cottage wall results from the uncalculated fact that the bricks could not be made more even in finish or in colour by the men or the technology employed on the job. At the same time, they have accentuated these shifting hues um, by laying the bricks in a sequence of similarity and difference. The inherent properties of the material coupled with, coupled with the controlled chance of the making process mean that a bounded variation is both inevitable and desired. Thus, the wall's appeal depends on um, random outcomes set in train and then harnessed by competent and imaginative human action. In the second case, the aesthetic appeal, appeal is managed and controlled and not obvi obviously the result of anything unforeseen. Variation is still desired, but the materials and their processing mean that this has to be introduced by a principle of design independent of a principle of making. I imply no judgment by this, only that there is a distinction between the kinds of intentionality in play in these cases, and that this distinction goes beyond a difference in finish. The metal dish photographed in the next slide was made by hand in copper. A flat circle, or blank as it's called, was cut from metal sheet. It was annealed to make it malleable, dipped in acid to remove fire scale, and finally beaten into shape against a concavity milled in the top of a tree trunk. The matte finish on the rim was generated using abrasive paper, while the dappled finish in the bowl was achieved by planishing, that is, beating the metal with the convex head of a highly polished, polished hammer. The abrasive paper removes imperfections introduced during the stage of beating. By contrast, planishing is a process that deliberately omits elements of the random, as seen from the close-up photographs of hammer impressions on the right of this slide. The head is carefully aimed and kept horizontal uh, to the metal, for it would spoil the workpiece to catch it with an edge. But much else falls to chance, so that the finish is infinitely varied and not repeatable. Machined imitations of planishing are common and rarely successful. The true effect is defiantly individual, it being a skilled process whose precise outcome is uncontrollable in its detail. For related reasons, Ruskin objected to the rustication, as he called it, of architectural stone. Rustication was a process that involved the deliberate roughening of surfaces to lend a natural effect. It was not frank in declaring its origin, and the labour process it promote, promoted reversed the usual order of priority in asking a workman to imitate perfectly what was other, otherwise in, unintentional. Similar complaints could be lodged against the rusticating rollers used in modern brickmaking. The Ruskinian workman aims for precision but accepts imperfections generated in good faith especially where they express a redemptive, fa redemptive failure of total control. I apply the word redemptive without insisting on a religious meaning. And yet I'm conscious that what Pi purges from the Ruskinian account um, is, the, is the theology. It, in acknowledging the inevitability of failure and yet recovering from that failure effects that are apt and humble, Ruskin admits to his aesthetics a version of grace. The meaning of the beauty created in these circumstances cannot be understood in relation to finish alone because it refers back constantly to the imperfect human agent. It is this theology that bridges the gulf between the aesthetic of imperfection and the experience of the worker and generates an outcome that is at once stringent and forgiving. A key question in craftsmanship arises from the way that we deal with mistakes. A worker who implements a design without any scope for revising it must throw away materials that do not meet the specification or which have been damaged by slips of the hand. Work not entirely guided by machine is especially susceptible to such mistakes and for this reason Pi refers to the workmanship of risk 
The sense that there is something at stake in fabricating an object, that it could at any moment be impaired, seems in fact a crucial aspect of what Ruskin meant by a working process that confesses its imperfection. Moreover, this awareness of risk is inextricable from his view of the worker as fallible. Fallible, but, nev but, but nevertheless a thinking subject. For with risks also come opportunities, opportunities to put right mistakes by making adjustments. Most rewarding is the chance to reconceive a mistake as a new aspect of the design, a design that can be altered because the head remains engaged with the hand. In the Limewood Sculptors of Renaissance Germany, Michael Baxendall elaborates on the connection between risk and a flexible de design process. Unlike oak, seasoned lime, seasoned limewood, retains a tract tractability and a porosity that leaves it vulnerable to serious radial splits. Baxendall shows how this natural vulnerability inspired a certain audacity in the sculptors who used it. From reading lines of strength and weakness, they turned to demonstrations of skill, discovering a curiously cerebral intricacy in hazardous play with the impulses moving about in the wood. Ultimately, Ruskin asks us to set the object aside and consider the history of its devising as a good or an ill in itself. In other words, the value of a productive outcome is only as good as the quality of the making experience. This represents a shift from thinking about ends to processes, to what Aristotle and the scholastic philosophers called habit, that is habitus in Latin or hexis in Greek meaning something like our disposition, health, or way of being. Ruskin encourages us to think not just about the end or technical quality of production, but about its fundamental character as a product of human endeavour. There's a link in this to his interest in the representational qualities of coinage. As a quality of precious metal, and as a promise to pay, sorry, as a quantity of precious metal and as a promise to pay, a coin represents the value stamped on its face. But also, and reciprocally, Ruskin finds that it is closely indicative of the honesty of the system of re revenue by which its value was originally endorsed. Once made things become commodities and are removed from their conditions of manufacture, they issue similar if less explicit, promises about their value and relatedly about the processes that brought them into being. In Unto This Last, Ruskin attacked the logic of the commercial text that says, buy in the cheapest market and sell in the dearest. And Ruskin uh, replies, yes, but what made your market cheap? Noting, charcoal may be cheap among your roof timbers after a fire. The example of charcoal is resonant not only as a traditional industry of the Lake District where Ruskin later settled, but because of its enduring trouble with provenance. Most of the charcoal now used in the United Kingdom is imported from Namib Namibia. Known as black gold, it is technically sound at point of use and cheap at point of sale, as well as an important source of foreign exchange for a poor country. But according to a recent report, much of what is exported is produced in dangerous and unsanitary conditions. In other words, the wholesome appearance of the charcoal and the value the market stamps on its face is misleading. It is a product tainted by a degrading process of production. Ruskin proposed the word ilth to, to cover cases such as this. Ilth denotes forms of wealth that destroy good habit in Aristotle's sense of the word. Ilth makes you ill and causes you trouble. Ruskin's view of happy work is rooted in his account of medieval labour practices. There is wishful thinking, thinking in his description of medieval masons and their working conditions. Nevertheless, it's apparent that the guild system generated forms of professional pride that we now struggle to sustain 
I'm thinking less of the quasi-mystical or divine action of Hephaestus or Vulcan than of a more mundane social respect. In the Stones of Venice, Ruskin describes the eighth side of the 21st capital at the lower arcade of the Doge's palace. It depicts, in Ruskin's words, a smith forging a sword or scythe blade, and it's inscribed Faber Sum. Standing in St. Mark's Square, that most publicly and elaborately fashioned of places, the force of the bare declaration, I am a maker, requires no supplement. Similar pride is apparent in the blacksmith's forge, which I showed you at the beginning of this lecture, uh, and which is printed on the front cover of the, the printed version of this lecture. I'll go back to it quickly to remind you what it looks like. Um, similar pride is apparent in, 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 this, in this work. A terracotta relief from the Ruskin collection made by Benjamin Kresik, a Sheffield grinder who was inspired to become a sculptor by a visit to Ruskin's St George's Museum in Walkley. Kresik depicts two men forging as a team. They're flanked on the right by a leg vice and other tools, and on the left by a group of admiring children. The act of making in this scene, and in many similar scenes um, in 19th century engravings um, showing working practices, the act of making in this scene fosters communal relations. And like the carved capital, it returns our attention to the human agent of production. This process is apparent in the subject, but also in the history of its creator, Kresik. In this way, the relief testifies to a working process discovering self-respect. Self-respect, as both Ruskin and Marx recognised, depends largely on retaining a personal stake in the labour process. And that explains why the vision of an independent blacksmith carries the point because he is independent, that is, and ha has a stake in his labour. But this need not be a limited conception, restricted to pre-industrial context contexts, as the educational programmes run by charities such as Ruskin Mill have demonstrated, the process of making can be a good in itself, one that facilitates form of education, forms of education and self-discovery. The ways in which craftsmanship can be educational bear further thought, Making offers an acute view, not just on the self, but the world, and it prizes open philosophical questions in, in ways hard to achieve by other means. Employing an artisanal analogy, W.B. Yeats once wrote that when a, poem, when a poem is finished, it comes right with a click, like a closing box. A box's click is largely an impression of closure, a sound generated by a mechanism or a subtle fit. But when did the craftsman who made the box feel that the box itself was finished? The point at which one stops is not necessarily the technical or even the personal pitch of perfection, but rather somewhere short of it. Thinking about completion, I would suggest, is an educative process one that joins the objects in the world to a sense of realised realized agency, of what one can bring into the world oneself. Developmental questions also cluster at the other end of making. To raise a metal bowl by hand is to be drawn in some manner to wonder at what point a raw material becomes the thing one is making, and whether in fact the raw material in that case, a sheet of copper is already a finished product of some kind. This manner of querying familiar distinctions is intrinsic to the process of making, a process that reconnects us with the material world by putting us in touch with the productive power that populated it with objects. Actually fashioning a thing obliges us to consider the criteria that make it acceptable one begins to wonder whether there is such a thing as perfect straightness or perfect flatness, and at what point these standards matter, and when they are only mental phantoms. <laughs>
that Ruskin was mistaken on certain questions should not preclude our using what endures and puzzling over what continues the challenge. I want to close by suggesting some further avenues of inquiry. One of the ways in which cultures of the machine are developing is apparent in the popularity of 3D printing, the use of a domestic scale rapid prototyping device to generate exact replicas of three-dimensional designs created on a computer. The technology hints at a return to a form of cottage industry, albeit in ways Ruskin did not imagine, with the prospect that design and manufacture may again be integrated. These developments remind us that history is not a motor vehicle offering a choice between forward and reverse. The solutions of the future are often haunted by the forms of the past, and the combination of elements is forever shifting. When West Germany set about rebuilding its economy after the Second World War, it instituted a system of apprenticeships that recovered aspects of the guild system. Reviving the cooperative principles of the 18th century Nuremberg workshop has served modern Germany well, proving that it still makes commercial sense to compete on quality, controlling price not through compromise, but by increasing efficiency. As Neil McGregor observed in his radio series, Germany, Memories of a Nation, the 21st century German motor industry has returned to the 16th century origins of Germany's reputation for fine metalworking and technical invention. With, his own traditions, sorry, with their own traditions of craftsmanship in wood, metal and porcelain, the Japanese have developed a factory system that encourages individual workers to stop the production line at the first sign of a problem or an opportunity in pursuit of Kaizen, meaning continuous improvement. Nissan at Sunderland employs these principles and is widely praised as one of Europe's most productive car plants. Such, such examples, as I'm sure many of you, would, will already have occurred to many of you, are, are often more complicated than they seem. Germany's competitiveness has relied partly on an artificially low currency, and the Volkswagen emissions scandal reveals a lack of probity that recalls problems in the banking industry. Accounting irregularities at Toshiba and the nuclear disaster at Fukushima expose similar weaknesses in Japan's corporate model. Nevertheless, it seems no accident that these two highly successful manufacturing nations have shared in common a history of respect for the way of the craftsman. Some of their recent problems reflect a failure to measure up to this standard in its ethical sense. More challenging is the possibility that craftsmanship itself has been a hindrance to them, that its traditions privilege a closed circle of loyalty and technical authority over, over liberal values of debate, dissent, and transparency. Ruskin placed an emphasis on the former, as did the medieval guilds whose hierarchical structure he borrowed for his own guild. But craftsmanship need not be inward-looking or institutionally confined. In its purest sense, it combines the stability of professional community with the values of accountability, integrity, and independence. So conceived, craftsmanship is not at odds with this, with this country's liberal tradition or with the principle of an open society. There are, I believe, opportunities for our manufacturing cities in the idea of a process-centered production that harnesses all the talents of the workforce not just, not just the manual ones, but also the creative and the critical, ta the critical talents. Ruskin's aesthetic of imperfection is less obviously served by industrial cases, but it too might be nurtured through technological innovation or in educational and amateur contexts. Indeed, I believe it will seem worth doing this for as long as we keep in mind Ruskin's most valuable teaching, that the human process preceding Pre preceding the manufactured product is the thing that counts and that much else will come right once we have found a way of using our weaknesses to bolster our strengths. Thank you very much.